So this is uh, it's a talk on the American Revolutionary War. It's a general history talk. It's not aimed at any experts or any expert knowledge in this. I'm, uh, I'm not, not a historian of this period. I'm just an interested party. And during the course of, of researching many other uh, talks and events in the past few years, I'd always came across archives that were interesting and things that related to this, this particular time. So I always kept a note of them, thinking that one day they could maybe be enough material to make a talk. And then this year, after doing a bit more research, I did find some more archives and I thought there's probably enough to kind of have a have a talk here. So I'll take this on. So this is the kind of look at the we're look at the push and pull factors here. So this is the road to revolution. So why did this war start? And this war promoted the 13 colonies in North America and the, and the British Parliament, and the British King. So what, what happened? What was the disconnects that happened here? So the, so the British government had defended a lot of American uh, militias and states during the Seven Years' War, which was, was a war involving France and also Native American tribes on either side. It was quite, it was quite a nasty war. There was guerrilla raids, ambushes. It was quite expensive as well. So the British government thought, you know, they had defended the colonies. And this is war. This was, this was a war in 1756, 1763, that George Washington had indeed cut his, cut his teeth with his local militia fighting for the British. So as things increasingly were getting ramped up with the Stamp Act and the Sugar Act, this is this was this is increased taxation on the colonies from the from the British government, and this was having a major disruption on the local economy. I mean, the Townsend Act, 1767, taxes and major imports, paper, lead, glass, teeth, so affecting pretty much every aspect of colonial society. And things did reach ahead in Boston with the Boston Massacre in 1770, where civilians were killed protesting out in the streets. And the Boston Tea Party, which people may know, it's, it's been dramatized and illustrated and uh, many, many times was it was an attempt to to destroy British tea rather than pay, rather than have taxes run, have to pay tax on it. So by a group called the Sons of Liberty. So this this revolutionary ferment is, is starting to stir, it's starting to it's starting to really, really pour out. So there's petitions to King George III, boycott of British goods. But however, in 1775, things reach ahead. Things are getting the tense. It's, it's ratcheting up, but things reach ahead. There's a battle of Lexington, Concord, which are minor skirmishes, but there is there is here there, there is casualties in this, and the war has officially begun. And this is not just uh, rebellious mal militias as King George would have thought it was. It's, it's now coming into a kind of full a full scale war, and we have this the Declaration of Independence, the Fourth of July, seventeen seventy six, which we all know, and we'll talk about later on. <clears throat> So this, just using these wee infographics, because I think it's handy just to give people an overview of this, because some people will know a lot about the American Revolutionary War, the American War of Independence, but a lot of people maybe don't. So it's interesting just to sort of, I just picked five timelines of things that I think are really interesting about it. So the first Continental Congress, this is meets in Philadelphia to define American rights and, and organize resistance to the course of acts. So this is the, the first the American the sort of idea of an American Parliament, an American Congress, an idea to formalize resistance to, to this. So the Battle of Lexington, 1775, which albeit a skirmish, but it greatly boosted the colonists' cause because they could inflict damage on the, on the British. It really was a psychological boost for them. The Declaration of Independence, 4th of July, 1776. This is when it's actually this is codified. This is it in paper. This declaration that we we will we will assert our rights from the Parliament and King George. We will become an independent nation. There's a real assertion. That, you know, this is a, such a powerful do document. So a key to the Americans is the France coming in to join them against the British. This is the key to the whole thing. If America can hold out long enough can just keep moving, can keep the war effort going, and France finally endorses and gets behind them. They may have a chance of winning this. And in 1778, France formally comes in after the Battle of Sar Saratoga, which was a big defeat for the British in uh, 1777. So British defeat at Yorktown, 1781. General Cornwallis surrenders at Yorktown, October 19, uh, 1781. That's the peace treaty isn't signed until 1783. So there's a timeline of just where, what sort of time period that, that we're in and some of the major events in it. So I'll now just start looking at through. This is 
talk features archives mainly, but it does also feature printed material and online sources because there's lots of things that complement each other. So when we talk about the US colonies, we talk about uh, 13 colonies essentially, which makes up the 13 colonies that would go on to form the basis of the United States of America. So we have New Hampshire, New York, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North and South Carolinas, and Georgia. And there's always a, an assumption that there was this, with the Continental Congress, there's this big unified colonies of 13 states, but it was far from it sometimes, because, for example, the people in, in Virginia, there was a kind of a distaste for New, New Englanders. There was rivals between people from Massachusetts and you know people from the Southern states. And so it, it wasn't always harmonious, but I think George Washington was the person who made it so, who galvanized all this dissent between each other to start to forge these colonies into the nation that we know. So the Boston Tea Party, this is a lovely illustration found in Prony. Any, Letters like INF seven bar B bar eight. That's the that's the prony reference number for the archive. So uh, you'll see various types of different numbers, but I have attached a number beside a document or an image. You'll see that's the archive number. I also at the end of the talk I'll give a a wee highlights list of major archives that I've used throughout this talk. So this is the this is the infamous famous Boston Tea Party. So this was the, in relation to the Tea Act and Post, so the whole colonial citizens to the monopoly of the East India Company. So they, they controlled all the trade in tea. So it stifles free trade. December 16, 1773, Bostonians boarded three British ships, three 342 tea chests overboard. The Parliament closed Boston Harbour until the tea was paid for. Massachusetts government suspended, Continental Congress called. And one thing that was particularly galling and is mentioned in the Declaration of Independence, is British troops being lodged in private homes. That was something, the Quartering Act, I think that was called, that was something that really, really irked people so much, having troops imposed in their households and having to feed them and pay for them and so on. Uh, that was something that really, really caused a lot of bitterness. So here's another, this is another colorful illustration, basically showing the same things uh, of this act taking place the tea being dumped overboard rather, rather than be so subject to the taxation of it. So the first mate, well, you know, there's been conflicts and before the war has been brewing, but the Battle of Bunker Hill is where it really, really lifts off into a really full scale conflict. This is 17th of June, 1775. So it was American, this, these are hills that Americans had held and, and, and retreated back to. American defeat, but a great cost to the British. I mean, a third of all British officers killed during the war died at Bunker Hill, died in this one day in an eight year war. So the British tactic of, of the of the of the big red line going up the hill, they, they, they thought with that's very intimidating. And as soon as the militia see a red line coming at them, they'll melt away. It wasn't the case because even the most cack handed sharpshooter couldn't miss this red wall coming at them. And the, the casualties inflicted on the British were colossal, although they did eventually win the day by reinforcements coming in through ship. So though, though the British now held Boston, they were besieged there essentially because they controlled the water, but they land around them. They, they didn't. And Nathaniel Green, who was a confidant and trusted aide of uh, George Washington, famously said, I wish we could sell the British another hill at the same price. So although it was a defeat for the Americans, they inflicted it. They were in the game. They were in the war. And this is an illustration by Hard Pile, which shows that kind of British battle tactic that they stopped using after Bunker Hill because it wasn't the just to so just march up the hill with trying to take some kind of defensive positions. It was a pretty suicide, you know, it, okay, it did win the day eventually by force of arms and force of might, but the casualties and the, the price was way too high. So uh, as I say, a third of all officers during the war were lost on that one day, which is staggering. So here we, here we have as a, a reference number for a letter from Edward Collins, Irishman to General Pomeroy. 4th of July, 1775. Now that's just the original document that we have, but I'll show you a transcription. Now, I might, because my screen's a little small, I might be able to if I can move that away. But uh, anyway, 
The more satisfactory the affairs here it is possible my part to give, yet beg the liberty to relate some particulars of the engagement with the rebels. What happened here? Just gonna move that up. What happened here on the 17th on the heights of Charleston as belonging to a regiment that suffered much and having the honor to command Lieutenant Colonel's company that day, the rebels were computed to be about 5,000 strong and we, and we not above 2,000. They had the advantage of a strong redoubt and entrenchment on eminence with some cannon. The 52nd battalions that I belonged to lost three captains killed on the spot. I will not trouble you with an imperfect account, but it said there was at least on our side, a thousand killed and wounded, 85 of whom were officers. Uh, and he ends the letter like when these troubles will end, God only knows, but it is a war that's much to be lamented. So he mentions 85 being officers. There was a lot of seriously injured officers, but a lot of them did recover. Again, it's J. Stewart, the General John Pomeroy, it's an account of the Battle of Bunker Hill. So General Pomeroy is getting these various accounts from senior officers coming into him. And they are broadly similar, but there's differences in the accounts of the figures because the figures are very hard to quantify because seriously ill, seriously injured people do recover. People who are mildly wounded do go on, go on to die. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to quantify this at that particular time. But Jay Stewart says, we gained a complete victory over the rebels at the expense of upwards of 30 officers killed. And this is closer to the real target, to the actual figures of officers killed and dead of their wounds, 16 more now lame wounded. And again, this very telling quote, such another victory would near unhinge our little army. The rebels have fortified the high grounds opposite us at Charleston, and in short, all the rising grounds at the different entries into Boston to prevent our penetrating into the country. So again, we're getting these accounts. This is a casualty list officers and of officers. Now there's, there's killed and wounded, killed and wounded, but the killed, I think the figures aren't as high as that, but I close you return of the numbers that are killed and wounded. You will please observe by letter is meant those that are dangerously wounded and with little hope of their recovery. So by the letters SD is meant those officers since dead of their wounds. So there is a lot of confusion over these actual figures at the end. So after, after that battle of Bunker Hill, where the, the uh, British did essentially win that, but they do end up, they having to evacuate Boston because it's not really strategically important enough for them to hold on to that narrow bit of ground with little chance of making inroads into the hinterland. So they do, part of the war aims of the British is New York, New York would be a better base. So in August, 1776, there's this massive show of force into, into New York of 30,000 uh, 30, soldiers, 10,000 sailors. So this is the new base in order to conduct the war. So Boston, not particularly important, but this New York's important because you can now isolate the New England states. If you retain that base in New York, you have the ability to isolate the New York, the New England states, get them out of the war, and then you can deal with the center and the south. And the south are still reckoned to be loyal to the king. So that's your, that's the aim is sort of changed. So this is a massive amphibious landing that only the British could really do, had had the ability to do as well as they did. And so Washington does try and defend Manhattan on Bunker Hill, but doesn't quite go to plan. So the war strategy where the British says capture New York, isolate New England, use Rhode Island as a base, never quite happened to win the war in the north. Then the South would fall easily as much as the population is still loyal, where Washington's army was just wore the British down, play for time, we get France into the war, and just at last, do not engage. As Washington says, we should on all occasions avoid a general action, Washington to Congress, but it, he doesn't do that. The first chance to get the troops are, their soldiers are desperate to get, a lot of them are wanting to get stuck in the war. They're very hard to, I think either strategy had, had its flaws, but uh, Washington's one certainly I don't think did work because he, he did engage them on, on many occasions. Didn't, didn't win very many of them actually, but did, did engage. So this is a lovely campaign map. This is hand-drawn possession of the first Marcus of Hastings to Lord Moira. So it's described in the catalog, that's the reference number for it there in the Prony catalog. Again, I'll do the references at the end of the talk, you'll see what I've used. So again, it's, it's hand-drawn and it's described as crude, but I think it's, it's, it's not bad, it's not bad. So these were kind of these hand-drawn campaign maps seeing, and Lord Murray in particular is also, can't quite see it, but he's also trying to pinpoint where the French fleet might come off at the coast, because this is gonna be the thing that the news they're really dreading if the French get involved. So it's, a, it's an interesting little, little archive, little piece there. 
So here we have John Dunlap from Straban, famously soldier and printer, the first copies of the Declaration of Independence. And mentions here in his soldiering, when the laws and government of this happy country require defense, the Philadelphia Calvary need but one hour's notice. So a fervent, fervent uh, continental, as we would call them then, the Continental Army, and to defend this at all costs, and it's just saying that like one hour's notice and he's he's away to war. You know, this is you leave every everything behind. It's, it's quite it's quite striking. And Dunlap, which we'll talk about, actually is born in Strabane, County of Tyrone, 1746, emigrated at the early age of to America, settling in Philadelphia, where he were like Franklin became a printer, industry and enterprise, one of the most extensive in the country. November 1771, he issued in Philadelphia the first number, Philadelphia pa packet or general advertiser. So in September 71, July 78, the British were in possession of Philadelphia's newspapers printed in Lancaster. E4 published daily from the first daily printed in the United States. Transferred with Wilson published a few years ago. So Dunlap was a printer of the convention met in Philadelphia before the revolution and also the Congress. First person he printed and published to the world this Declaration of Independence, which, which we'll look at soon. So this is a, a lovely letter. Lindsay in her introduction had, had mentioned about, she had been with me one time and we had acquired some material. This was going back a few years. And I remember we were at this little isolated farmhouse in the country in the West somewhere. And there was no, there was no uh, letter on the door, but there was a goat in the garden. And that's how we find the, the person who had contacted us about this. And I, I remember at the time reading these, this was one of the letters that we, we collected that day. Uh, from uh, Job Johnson to his brother Robert in County Londonderry. And he was actually, Job was in America and was involved in the war. And I, I remember thinking to myself, I have to use this sometime because this is such a, a rare piece of history to find someone on the continental side, uh, you know, really talking about his experiences. So I did a little bit of transcripts from the record. You can see the, the actual archives in quite poor condition because it is quite old, but we do have a copy of it on the catalog like an A version. So you see the word A, D4618 slash 4A. That's the, that's the open version. The actual bar four version, the original letter. We couldn't say because it's really, really fragile. But it's good when he talks about this, you get this real sense of, of passion and belief in this. Because I mean, as Job says, was to my great joy that I ordered to Philadelphia to join the army with his excellency, George Washington. I left the Indian country in August. So presumably somewhere near Ohio or somewhere in the West. Having, having marched 600 miles to Philadelphia and joined our troops then on the march to Williamsburg. So, I mean, 600 mile march, that's, that can't, can't, can't be easy, but uh, it's just, just a fascinating letter. So we do encounter Job Johnson further after the war when he writes to his brother following his conclusion of the American War of Independence. And so he now has served as a deputy uh, the assistant deputy commissioner for the state of Pennsylvania. So maybe that 600 mile march did pay off. So the pleasure I, I this morning feel of having through the infinite and kind redeemer's goodness, a life like mine prolonged through a long and severe war. The hardships I have been partaker of, but bless God who has at last given us the victory and established our independency. So there you go, Job Johnson from Slatterbogie, originally in Slatterbogie in County Londonderry. Now I, a big chief in Philadelphia, doing very well for himself. So another thing I looked at when doing some research for this was I found this little archive with the official guidebook and map of Colonial Williamsburg. And it's really, really, it's just enchanting because the illustrations in it. So Williamsburg, Virginia, which I hope to go to one time, named after King William III. Kind of interesting because it's it was capital for colonial Virginia and for Virginia patriots uh, on, on the so it's, it's kind of this kind of pro British heritage and then this pro American heritage if you like so center of events led to the American Revolution gunpowder incident 1775 we'll talk about that militia Marines Patrick Henry Governor Dunmore one time headquarters for Washington and for Lord Corn Cornwallis so it's famous architecture and gardens. And also, interestingly, the Declaration of Independence first read aloud in public on the courthouse steps, July the 25th, 1776, so several weeks after it was first announced. This lovely map of the time, I believe a lot of these buildings are still here, it is one of the prime examples of colonial America. So it's a beautiful, beautiful, color, colorful map that I came across in the archives. Uh, 
some of the some of the architecture, some of the little inserts on the on the maps are very worth note, like uh, the Capitol Williamsburg building. Some of the the colonial architecture is absolutely fabulous. So this is the famous in incident in Williamsburg it happened in the twentieth, seventeen seventy April twentieth, seventeen seventy five. Lord Donmore already gone quite a remove from the magazine in Williamsburg. So malicious led by Patrick Henry. He's a real firebrand. There's a reputation. There's really fervent revolutionary firebrand patriot forced to stand off with British Marines. So the matter was resolved and the gunpowder returned with Lord Dunmore having to flee Williamsburg for the safety of Royal Navy ships on the York River. So this is all in contained in D3561 NC20. <clears throat> There's the courthouse, the famous courthouse where Benjamin Waller, a local lawyer, had read aloud the United States Declaration of Independence just on those court steps after it arrived from Philadelphia. So you can imagine for local people, this must have been something, something you hear about. And then when you're actually listening to this firsthand, the belief and the and the actual, the, the strong words being used and the belief in yourself and your young country to go it alone and, and so on. It's, it must have filled people's hearts with just something, immense pride. It's just hard to imagine on that spot. <clears throat> so it's a rally, rally tavern. It's just named after Sir Walter Raleigh. This again, this is all Williamsburg. These are all significant buildings in Williamsburg, which I believe are all still, still there. So it was a meeting place for patriots and legislators. So Patrick Henry, who we mentioned earlier, and Thomas Jefferson met in the Apollo room as representatives of the people. So I'm sure there was some discussions taking place there. I'm sure some, some ideas were hatched, some things were said. And this is Patrick Henry, of course, who was described as a line of liberty, the motto of the American Revolution, give me liberty or give me death. So there's really, there's no going back when you start coming out with comments like, like that. So another sort of side avenue of doing research for this talk was looking, I came across material, I, I think some material it just chooses itself. I, I don't choose it. I maybe find it and then I can use it. This was interesting little pamphlets I came across that were trades in colonial America. Again, there's, there's the Brony reference number. Uh, the printer in the 18th century, Williamsburg, an account of his life and times. And I, I'm not going to show a lot of it here. I'm just going to show a brief illustration. But I actually find once you start reading this material, you, you gain this idea of the social life and the trades and how life was lived. Because essentially what we're talking about is war. But there is another, the, the, the Miller, any of these of Virginia, with beautiful illustrations in these pamphlets and a kind of mills and the craft of milling, as well as a description of the windmill near the palace in Williamsburg. It's fantastic. Now, here's my favorite, though, is Trades Clone America is the wig maker. I always thought, you, I mean, you, when you do research for things and you're going down rabbit holes, but I could have spent months looking at wig makers in the 18th century Williamsburg because it was just absolutely fascinating and thinking like how important were wigs to the war effort I mean there's your PhD topic standalone straight there as, as you can see by the illustrations it's absolutely captivating but I digress we'll have to go back so here we have the very famous painting I used in my, in my cover illustration of George Washington crossing the river Delaware this is uh this is the night of the December the 25th early hours of December the 26th uh, 1777, 1776, because to raid the raid on Trenton, which gives Washington his first major victory of the war against the Hessian garrison. This is originally painted by Emanuel Leutz, 1851, which is a part of the Kunsthall collection in Bremen, in Germany. Originals destroyed in an Allied bombing raid in 1942. There are there's two other copies. Two other versions of the painting made, and they both reside in America, as far as I know, in the in the Library of Congress. So the flag depicted in the second and the on the Second Continental Congress, this flag wasn't used till it, almost a year after the picture was, was depicting the actual time, but it was just a detail, I suppose. But the, these these events are Washington's raid on Trenton, which again to get these to do this this raid on Christmas night when they really needed a win they needed something because they really had experienced a lot of setbacks that winter was horrendous and then to to get that that raid on Trenton then the further battle of Princeton off the back of that really seemingly kept everybody back in the game because things things hadn't been going so well up to that point and it's a very heroic and it's it's a it's an iconic painting it's absolutely stunning so another thing I came across was a Virginia Revolutionary War map, 1774-73. A cover doesn't look like much, but I thought I'll have a look at this. And then this thing unfolded before me. And I was absolutely blown away at how wonderful it was. The color 
in the actual map. And also these little details of architecture. Now, this is only a small segment of the map because there would be over many, many different screens to, to do the entire map because it's quite large when it folds out. Also had these little campaign trails, you know, blue for the Continentals, red for the British and how they had overlapped and uh, fought each other and intertwined and how this war and, and around Virginia, Virginia being really a key to the whole campaign, right in the middle of it. Again, you see these intertwining of these routes and maps and skirmishes and battles in Chesapeake Bay and Virginia. So it's really key to the whole thing, really key to the whole war. So Washington said, famously said, this is in a Kennedy book, Scots Irish in the Hills of Tennessee. It says, if defeated, because Washington, don't forget, had many, many setbacks. You know, I'd, I'd read recently of the eight major battles Washington had engaged, and he actually lost five. He'd won two and drawn one. So it, it wasn't, you know, the record wasn't great. You know, if you're, if you're a Premier League football manager, you'd, you'd be looking over your shoulder with that. So, but he did famously say, my final stand for liberty amongst the Scots and Irish of my native state, Virginia. And this has kind of prompted me to look at, well, how Irish was Washington's army? Because reports have been or 15% Irish, 20% Irish, you know, all was significant, but not the major part of the army. But the most recent research I read on this, which was by Philip Tucker, an American academic, is published last year, 2020. And he goes much higher than this. And he was saying Washington's army largely was probably about 40% Irish, but he includes Scots Irish and the, what he described as Celtic Irish. So both, both sort of religious divides in Ireland fighting for the Continentals, fighting for liberty, fighting for the rights. Uh, we have came across, not all the militia records survive, but there are significant amounts of it. And there are the ones that I've been able to find, I've been able to reference here. So the Irish and the American War of Independence, the four companies, the 11th Pennsylvania Regiment, the birthday of the soldiers were recorded. The, the proportion that was born in Ireland were 65 percent, 58, 55, 40. So this is part of an address given by Sean Farrell, actually in 1976, as the bicentenary in Washington, D.C. of the start of the American Revolutionary War. And he, uh, that ambassador, does really take great pains to, to, to stress about the Irish involvement in the war. And these figures are this, this is one militia, but it's very, very high. And then we see South Carolina, born in Ireland, Captain Heatley, 50%, volunteer company of Rangers, 50%, Captain McLaughlin, second Charleston, Captain Purvis. So again, in another sample of our militia, staggering amount of, of, of people born in Ireland, way over 50%. It's Lord Mountjoy after the war, so in America was lost by, by Irish immigrants. Famous old quote. So 1780 returns the Delaware Regiment of Colonel Henry Hill, 50% soldiers of Irish descent, 7th Pennsylvania Regiment, uh, commanded by Colonel William Irvine. Now this is, Pennsylvania is huge, the four companies were 76% born in Ireland, phenomenal, very, very high. So here we have one of the most, copy of one of the most famous documents in history. This is the, this is the game changer. This is the thing that, changes everything for the, for the cause, Galvani galvanizes, makes it real, gives war aims, tells people why we're doing it, why we need to get away, break away, why we need independence. So it's absolutely striking. So I may quote, I obviously couldn't read the whole thing, but I have a text here. So I'll just read a little bit from the start <clears throat> and from the end. So when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So it's incredibly, it's incredibly strong language. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that, um, uh, that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Famous quotation from the start. So it does go on to basically our, our lay down why it's objecting to King George and the British government. And it does mention a few things. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, 
for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, and it goes on and on and on, listing these grievances. So the final, the final part of the document does say, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. And they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. So it's not it's not pulling any punches. It's actually putting its aims really clearly about what it actually wants. Again, that's another later copy of it. Uh, not not quite. It's not quite as impactful as the first one, I think. But again, there is different versions. Now we we only hold a few. We hold a couple of copies of this. They're not, they're not originals. There's originally there's twenty four of them in existence. Now this is something I came across, and it stopped me in my tracks, because. The signature at the bottom, G Washington. And I thought to myself, surely it can't be in Pruny in Belfast. There's a, there's a copy of a letter by George Washington. Surely not. Then he's a red, I read on. Letter from George Washington headquarters. This is Springfield, Massachusetts. Thread the British fleet during the American War of Independence. So this intelligence which you were pleased to communicate to me has been previously transmitted to me by General Foreman from Monmouth. I have not yet learned whether Sir Henry Clinton came with the fleet or whether any of what numbers of troops were on board. The enemy remained in the same position upon the point. So this is about it's naval intelligence. That's quite meaty stuff. June 1780, again, coming to the end of the war, but concern for the American army is always the British, the Royal Navy, always because they can bring these massive arms to bear and supplies and armies in to the coast. So it's the signature that, that stopped me in my tracks when I seen that. That is a copy of a letter with George Washington's signature, which I just thought was absolutely fantastic. I did have to do a double take on that and pinch myself several times to realize that's actually a letter from George Washington. That's incredible. So there we go. So we're coming to the end of the conflict in 1781. <clears throat> this, is on, this is on the map that I showed you earlier, the campaign maps in, in, from Virginia. And this is the CG York time. Again, this is where the British hope to be supplied, as always, by the Royal Navy and continue to conduct the war. But the in intervention of the French fleet in the Battle of Chesapeake Bay, which drove the British Navy off, meant the, Ameri the British Army was effectively cut off. The French Navy on one side, the Continental Army on the other side, it couldn't go anywhere. And that was the decisive factor that ended the war. In October 1781, the British surrender at Yorktown. That's engraving the printing number. Very beautiful illustration that that we have. The detail in it, fantastic. Beautiful, beautiful document. Again, the famous painting by John Thrumble, which uh, has the British surrender at Yorktown. So that's putting an end to things. Now, although the, the war ended in 1781. Edmund Burke famously saying that a revolution made not by chopping and changing of power in any existing states, but by the appearance of a new state, of a new species in a new part of the globe. So though we talk about the American Revolutionary War, what is the American Revolution? Is it still taking place? Is it over? Is it being resolved? Probably not. <clears throat> this, is something, this is something we hadn't seen. So Washington famously wouldn't take a salary during the war, but did, did put his expenses in, which came to that figure was $64,000 of eight years, of, I think it was eight years of war. But Congress paid him in devalued currency and war certificates, so it may have only been worth 1 20th of the original value. So, you know, you argue know, George Washington really didn't do it for the money because he didn't make anything off it. Actually, with all his land holdings and stuff, I think he, he was still having financial problems after the war. He, Again, who's the only president not to govern from the capital city of the United States? Clearly, they both share the same name. Washington is the only president not to govern from the city that bears his name. 
Government transferred to Washington, 1800. George Washington died 1799. It's a wee trivia thing I came across. I th thought it was interesting. This is the Treaty of Paris, 1783. It's painted by Benjamin West, famously. Now, this is, I always call this the presence of absence because the British delegation wouldn't sit for it because it's a humiliation. It's a defeat. So we do have the people present in this. John Jay. John Adams. Benjamin Franklin, Henry Lawrence, and a rather wistful William Temple Franklin. But it is that whole idea of the presence of absence that really tells the story that they refuse to sit. It's just a very powerful, it just looks like a, a painting that's incomplete. And in many ways it is, but the absence of the other figures who should be in the painting are striking. I, I did come across that, I thought it was a really telling telling tale of what the humiliation must have felt like. So there are some pruny key sources, anyone interested? So the hand-drawn campaign map, the reference number, the John Dunlap Memorandum, the Johnson, the Job Johnson, remember him? 600 mile march to join Washington at Williamsburg, the copy of the George Washington letter, the guide, the lovely guide to colonial Williamsburg, and the copy of the Declaration of Independence. So there's some of the key sources that I've used. And just uh, this summer in a Scottish castle, a, a rare piece of, of American history was found in the attic of a Scottish ancestral home, an actual uh, edition of the, of the Declaration. And it sold for an eye-watering three million £210,000 or $4,420,000. So, you know, these things are fine. These things are right there. So always, always keep an eye on it because you, you never know. Now, I, I would uh, like to sing a song just to end this talk. I mean, the screens went there here. I'd like to uh, sing, sing a song because part of my research was looking at protest songs and so on. And I thought it might be a nice way to end this talk just want to check, check the time, uh, would be just to sing one of the songs that I had researched. And this was a song I came across called Fish and Tea. And it's kind of like the whole Boston Tea Party, the taxation of, of, of uh, uh, the trade embargoes imposed on the, on the colonists and that whole setup before things went to war. It's, it's just a wee jaunty folk song. It lasts about a minute. So if you bear, bear with me, please. <clears throat> What a court hath old England of folly and sin. In spite of a Camden, Burke, Wilkes, and Glynn. Not content with the game, Mac, the tax, fish, and sea. And America drenched with hot water and tea. Very down, down. Hey, Derry down, Derry down, down, hey, Derry down. Now indeed these poor people's nerves are so weak. How good it is their destruction to see. Dr. Johnson's a proof in the highest degree. His soul and his system were changed by tea. Very down, down, hey, very down, very down, down, hey, very down. Knowing where this oppression will stop. Some say there's no cure but a capital chop. And yet I believe. Americans wish since you've wrenched them with tea and deprived them of fish. Dairy down, down, hey, dairy down, dairy down, down, hey, dairy down. There we go. So that's it, folks.